So it's my great pleasure to introduce um, uh, Professor Manolis Kellis, uh, who's a professor of computational science from MIT, whose uh, contributions we've already heard through the many questions that he's, he's addressed to the speakers this afternoon. Um, uh, Manolis does some fantastic work in, in integrating large data sets, both functional and comparative genomics, um, and which really helped to understand the, the function and the role of the human genome. So very much looking forward to hearing his talk, which he's only just finished writing. We got some new data a few minutes ago, so uh, it's in. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's really a, a tremendous honor to be here. I've enjoyed this meeting year after year, and to think that they would invite me back uh, is, is quite surprising, but uh, very, very delighted to be here. Uh, what I'll tell you about today is our work on trying to dissect the regulatory underpinnings of complex disease through the use of regulatory genomics as well as epigenomics and uh, how it applies to uh, both uh, common uh, uh, diseases as well as uh, complex traits and uh, cancer a little bit. So uh, you all know the challenge of basically starting from genetic variants and trying to figure out their actual mechanistic basis. And uh, we need to understand, of course, the gene annotation, the non-coding annotation, their roles in gene and chromatin regulation, as well as their variation across individuals. And a big foundation that our field has been uh, relying upon is a basic annotation of uh, functional elements, many of which were initially discovered by, by this crowd, uh, such as promoters, enhancers, insulators, uh, post-transcriptional regulatory elements, microRNA targets, and so on and so forth. So the way that I think about this is that these are the building blocks of gene regulation, and we need to build, put these building blocks together into regulatory networks, and we need to understand exactly the impact of a single nucleotide mutation in the specific cell type in which every disease will be acting. And that's a tremendous challenge. So how do we go about doing that? Well, the approach that we have taken in my group is to actually uh, color uh, chromatin in chromatin states. So I uh, was... <laughs> Uh, very delighted to see a Chrome HMM uh, plot in the, in the previous uh, uh, talk, uh, where you actually use the specific combinations of histone modification marks, of which uh, you know there are uh, 100, more than 100 right now, in order to define at the nucleosome level the specific color of chromatin uh, that defines enhancer regions that I'm going to be showing in orange throughout this talk, promoter regions in red, transcribed regions in green, and then repressed regions in gray. And of course, there's a much larger diversity of chromatin that we're summarizing here. We're also going to be looking a little bit at the DNA methylation that happens directly on the DNA, as well as accessibility. So what I'm going to talk about today is, number one, how does the ENCODE project and the Roadmap Epigenomics project uh, use these data set to characterize the epigenomic landscape? How do we actually look at differences between different cells and tissues? And then how do we exploit these differences to learn activity patterns, modules, and networks that can help us guide the interpretation of non-coding variants? And then I'm going to switch for the remainder of the talk into applying this to disease data sets. So first of all, how do we identify the disease-relevant tissues and regulators at the genome-wide level? And now how do we use that to go and dissect mechanistically individual non-coding loci that are associated with disease? And beyond these individual top loci, I'm going to try to convince you that you know, there's, in fact, a very large tail of known coding regions that are weakly associated <laughs> with disease, but continue to be functional at very modest effects down, down, down the rank list. And lastly, beyond these rare variants that are emerging from these studies, uh, that somatic mutations in cancer are also converging into the same regulatory pathways enabling us again to open a, a picture to discover new um, cancer genes. So let's start with characterizing the epigenomic landscape. So uh, the ENCODE project had mapped a small number of cell types in uh, very deep data sets. Uh, and what the, ENCODE, uh, what the uh, Roadmap Epigenomics Project has done is try to push this to the next level and try to actually focus on primary tissues and cells from both adult and embryonic developmental stages, as well as uh, ES cells, IPS cells, and ES-derived cells, as well as uh, a large number of primary cell types and cell lines from uh, different individuals. Uh, 
and uh, we have mapped five uh, histone modifications, color coded again according to these functional elements. Um, promoters, enhancers, transcribed, repressed, and heterochromatic regions across all 127 epigenomes that I'm going to be talking about today, as well as uh, H3K27 and H3K9 acetylation, which are associated with both enhancer and promoter activity uh, in a subset of about two thirds of the cell types, and then more than 20 additional histone modifications in additional cell types, as well as DNA hypersensitivity in about half of the cell types whole genome by sulfide, reduced representation by sulfide, as well as MRE and Imidib in a subset of cell types, and then RNA-seq in about half the cell types. And I'm going to talk a little bit about MP genome imputation because you're sort of thinking, okay, that's a lot of haves. Uh, we've actually uh, dealt also with the have-nots and imputed all of these data sets across all the cell types. So a large diversity of biology and a very large number of data sets. And I guess the reason why you invited me here today is how does a computer scientist deal with all these data sets? So the way that we do that is uh, work with amazingly talented folks like Anshul Kundaji, uh, who's now a professor at Stanford, and Walter Melleman, who's still a postdoc with me, uh, and try to summarize that information in these chromatin states. So what are chromatin states? They're basically learned completely automatically across the genome. They're basically taking a large number of histone modification variants and training a multivariate hidden Markov model across all of them in order to predict the hidden state of the epigenome given the observed individual marks. So what the hidden states that are learned end up with are sort of these particular combinations based on these marks and uh, giving them names is sort of what the human does. But everything else the machine does automatically, including generating these pictures which now can tell you across 127 different epigenomes 111 of which come from the Roadmap Epigenomics Project and 16 of which come from ENCODE. What is the activity of different genes and different regulatory elements across different cell types? So what you see here is that some genes are very strongly repressed by polycomb. So you see here this polycomb associated H3K27 trimethylation mark that is marking this particular uh, region across all of the cell types except for a handful where you can see that the individual genes are actually escaping repression. And you see the active promoter here, the uh, transcribed enhancers uh, in, light, uh, in Lyme, as well as the yellow enhancers in the transcribed uh, regions. Other genes have more of a lineage-restricted activation, where you can see here this particular gene is off in a lot of the B cells and blood cell types and on in embryonic stem cells and so on. And uh, other genes are ubiquitously uh, uh, active, or at least showing this strong uh, and weakly associated uh, marks associated with transcription. The other feature you see immediately is that promoters are extremely uh, stable across different cell types, while enhancers, which are shown in orange, are extremely dynamic. So we can start actually uh, exploiting that to link enhancers to the activity of their nearby, nearby genes. So I've been focusing on that summary right here, which is uh, for each of the 127 cell types. So that's IMR90 right here, just the very top line. But IMR90 itself, if you expand it out, has a large number of different histone modification marks, as well as DNA methylation, as well as uh, linking uh, information uh, from high C and these topologically associated domains that we heard about already. You can see here the different types of repression. So uh, polycomb repression versus heterochromatic repression versus whole genome by sulfide, um, uh, evidence of DNA methylation repression. And um, uh, you can see here how they sort of take over uh, from each other, as well as this very high concordance of all of these marks, which of course uh, is what we're basing the summarization of these epigenomes uh, that we're using. And these are available across seven reference epigenomes but we've also imputed all of those across all 127 epigenomes. So what is the first thing you can do? You can basically ask, well, what is the relationship between these histone marks as well as gene expression levels and DNA methylation levels and DNA accessibility levels? So what you see is that uh, we've partitioned these chromatin states according to whether they're associated with active transcription or repression. So the repressed genes tend to be associated with this bivalent and quiescent and polycomb repressed states, while active genes tend to be associated with, you know, these first uh, few states of promoter, enhancer, and transcribe. But what's also remarkable is that when you look at DNA methylation, which in the previous slide I was sort of referring to as repressive, you see here that uh, both active enhancers as well as repressed 
uh, polycomb regions are in fact showing the same level of intermediate methylation. If you look at these highly methylated regions, you basically see quiescent regions, as you would expect. But of course, as this community knows, transcribe regions, which are very strongly methylated. And then if you look at promoters, whether they're active, uh, associated with an active gene or a repressed gene, you can actually see that they simply are devoid of uh, methylation. So simply looking at DNA methylation level uh, is not sufficient to actually predict the activity of neighboring genes. You actually need to do that in the context of the chromatin state annotation. Similarly for DNA accessibility, you see that, of course, promoter regions are extremely accessible, but so are poised, uh, you know, bivalent uh, TSS regions as well as bivalent flanking regions. And of course, enhancers and TSS flanking regions right here. So again, accessibility alone does not distinguish between activation and repression, because whether the repressor sits there or the activator sits there, you basically get that signal of this open chromatin. So that's why it's extremely important to sort of interpret the genome in the context of these annotations. And I would argue that for a lot of the DNA methylation variation that we've seen in uh, this conference, I think it is extremely important to have a reference uh, set of epigenomic annotations with which to interpret that variation across individuals. And then you, you'll see a much stronger correlation between activity and um, level of methylation. The other thing we can do is actually start clustering the genome across uh, the whole three billion bases at, uh, in this particular example, one megabase at a time. So we can, we've done this at various levels of resolution. So what you see is that about half the genome is falling in this quiescent state across these 127 cell types. So this is the average representation of every region across the 127 uh, epigenomes. Actually, it's across a subset of 43 epigenomes that are as diverse as possible because there's a lot of redundancy in these data sets. So we excluded that. So this is highly representative of unique epigenomes. So about half the genome is basically sitting in this quiescent region. And the other half of the genome is uh, much more active. And you can see here that this corresponds to these chromosomal bands, which are much darker here and much lighter here. And, and also in these lamina associations, which are much stronger here and much weaker here. And that's the picture that all of us have seen from high C and you know, from decades, really, of cell biology, that there are these two compartments. But what's really interesting is that within this active compartment, there are a lot of subdivisions, which are also associated with gene density and lamina association, which, again, we can discover simply by looking at these uh, chromatin state annotations across these different cell types. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the very dense sampling of uh, epigenomic data sets allows us to actually now go a step further and start imputing ep epigenomes. So if I have 2,000 data sets that I have already measured, I can impute another 4,000 data sets, which I have never actually previously observed. And of course, the question is, how well should I trust these imputed data sets? Well, I uh, challenge you to now try to res uh, sort of guess which one is observed and which one is uh, imputed. Uh, you know, um, of course, I've labeled it here. So the observed <laughs> data sets are blue, and the imputed data sets are red. But uh, yeah, you, know, you can see here that Jason Ernst was actually able to predict not only the rough level, uh, the, the, the rough position of these different modifications, <laughs> but the actual level of these modifications across different cell types. And when you start zooming in, you start seeing here even the dips in the chromatin profile that correspond to, to accessible regions are in fact very strongly predicted uh, at 25 nucleotide resolution for DNAs, histone marks, and RNA, and at single base pair resolution for whole genome bisulfite. You can also uh, start asking, well, how accurately do I recover these uh, data sets? And we've used a large number of uh, uh, similarity metrics with observed data, as well as with annotated protein coding uh, regions, as well as transcription start sites and protein coding genes. And we find that, indeed, they are very high accuracy. And in fact, I'm going to go a step further and say that when they disagree, the observed data is actually in trouble. So um, whenever the uh, observed data set and the uh, sort of shows a globally weak uh, agreement with the imputed data set, we actually find that the quality control metrics that we have run for all of these data sets are in fact dramatically lower, suggesting that the imputed data has the ability to actually um, serve as a quality control for the observed data sets, potentially as a pseudo replicate for these data sets uh, that we have, you know, of course, used um, across, across these epigenomes. 
What's also remarkable is that the imputed data is extremely cell type specific. So we find a lot of coherence in the imputed data sets of different <laughs> tissues and cell types and a lot of disagreement between you know, these tissues and different tissues. Uh, and the recovery of the cell type specific relationship is actually greater than even observed data sets. Um, and it's extremely robust. Why? Because the effective sequencing depth of what we're using here is actually much larger. And there's much less experimental noise. So this is observed data, and this is imputed data around the transcription start site. And you can see here just how noisy the observed data is and just how reproducible the observed data is. So I haven't yet told you how Jason does it. I've just told you his name. That should be enough to convince you that he's great. But uh, actually, I should mention that Jason's a professor at UCLA. He's no longer with me. Uh, and uh, the way that he does it is that he, he uses an ensemble learning approach where he's exploiting both the similarity of other marks as well as the context within the same tissue and the similarity between the same mark observed in different tissues. And the features are not hard-coded. These are actually learned automatically using a pretty clever training approach where you can actually learn these relationships in pairs of tissues that you're not trying to impute on and then use them in whatever tissue you're actually trying to uh, impute on. So that's a little bit of the characterization of the epigenomic landscape. Let's now start focusing on some of the differences between different cell and tissue types. So Walter Milliman has now clustered all of the epigenomes using H3K4ME1 signal. And what you can see here, based on this coloring, is that uh, T cells and embryonic stem cells, iPS cells, uh, as well as uh, smooth muscle, um, you know, foreskin, uh, heart, and uh, uh, other muscle uh, are all clustering together. So there's a lot of information in this epigenomic landscape that allows us to actually recognize completely de novo which uh, data sets are actually similar to each other. You can see here how brain uh, is actually split between adult brain and fetal brain. And fetal brain is actually more similar to these neuronal progenitor cells than adult brain, which again tells you something about the uh, particular mark and how it varies across uh, these epigenomes. You can also start looking at the representation of different uh, chromatin states across different cell types. You can see here that embryonic stem cells have a very strong enrichment of these bivalent uh, TSS re uh, uh, chromatin states, which again, you would have expected. But you also see that T cells and B cells are sort of depleted for transcription start site, this promoter-associated state, and this uh, weakly transcribed state. And you see also that IMR90, which was previously used as a control for a non-pluripotent cell, is in fact three standard deviations away from the mean when it comes to the amount of polycomb repressed state that it has. And again, three deviations away from the mean for the amount of quiescent state uh, that it has. So again, uh, this allows us to now pick representative tissues in the context of all of these other tissues that we're learning. You can also go beyond this tree representation of the previous slide and start looking at the <coughs> Uh, principal components of variation in this particular MDS plot where you can see that T cells are the most different from ES cells and that uh, different groups of cells are in fact, uh, cells and tissues are in fact uh, revealed simply by looking at, in this particular case, H3K4ME1. And we see similar separation for nearly all of the marks when you look at the, the relevant chromatin states. So instead of just looking across the whole genome, we look at H3K4ME1 in enhancer regions, H3K4ME3 in promoter regions, H3K36 trimethylation in transcribed regions, and then the signal of the cell separation becomes very clear. We can also look at differences between cell types in terms of the switching, uh, in, you know, more globally, as well as as you start going down the differentiation lineage, what kind of changes are happening when you go forward in differentiation or when you compare things you know, backward in differentiation. And you can see here that the changes that are happening during differentiation are actually different in TSS proximal regions, which tend to switch from uh, these uh, you know, inactive regions to transcribed regions, and TSS distal regions, which tend to switch from these uh, bivalent states to these active states, again, uh, across, across the whole genome. So that suggests that different lineages are, in fact, perhaps showing some common features that we can start recognizing not just one lineage at a time, but across all of the lineages that we have represented here. So we can exploit these patterns to actually start learning uh, regulatory networks, to start connecting things together into modules. Um, and I showed you this picture before, and I told you that enhancer regions in orange are scattered uh, you know, throughout, and they're much more um, dynamic than promoter regions. 
So now I can take every single one of these orange squares and look at 2.3 million of them across the whole genome and start clustering them together into common patterns in order to reveal uh, their patterns of activity. So now I've taken these 2.3 million DNAs regions that are showing enhancer-only marks that do not show any promoter marks in any of the cell types, and I've clustered them into approximately 200 activity patterns. And you can see here that a very small subset of those are, in fact, fairly ubiquitous, some of them in pluripotent cells, other in more differentiated tissues. And um, most of them, however, have this extremely tissue-specific and linear-specific pattern of activity. You can see here that uh, T cell active enhancers are in fact sitting near genes that are involved in immune functions. You can see here that uh, these uh, embryonic stem cell uh, enhancers are enriched in developmental processes, uh, learning and memory uh, genes are near brain enhancers, muscle with muscle, and uh, so on and so forth. So this regulatory network is split across the whole genome with these enhancers that are just, you know, falling um, uh, in, in, you know, these very large number of locations. But in fact, you could summarize that into only a small number of activity patterns. What we can do now is ask, well, if the nearby genes show such a strong enrichment, maybe we can actually exploit this clustering to actually start linking enhancer regions to their target genes. And it's, you know, most of the time, it's actually not the nearest gene that is being targeted. So these enrichments become much stronger, of course, when we do that. But what Jian Rong uh, Wang has done in the group is that he took this matrix of enhancers, he built a similar matrix for gene expression patterns, and then he said, let me now take the clusters of, en of enhancers and clusters of, of uh, gene expression patterns and link clusters to clusters. Why does he do that? Because it's actually a very much more robust way of doing things. Instead of just trying to link 2.3 million elements where you're extremely uncertain as to who the target should be, you're basically doing the linking at the level of modules, and then you project that down into individual elements in any one region, giving you a very robust linking. So here are some examples of what this linking looks like. So here is a target gene that I'm representing as a tall bar here, and all of the linked enhancers that I'm res representing as stick marks. And depending on whether they're actually supported by high C or not, they're actually colored differently. So you see here that the vast majority of them are in fact supported by high C, specifically in the matching cell types. So this is one example. This is how well you can predict high C links across the genome for each of the matching uh, tissues. And you see an AUC curve of about uh, 0.79. And then for Chia Pet and EQTLs, you see uh, slightly higher uh, performance here and uh, slightly lower, actually still slightly higher performance for EQTLs, suggesting that, in fact, the activity-based linking that we're predicting based on these data sets is actually in very strong agreement with both the physical interactions from HiC and Chia Pet as well as the genetic interactions from EQTLs. And you also see here that it's extremely cell type specific. So depending on where these data sets were measured, you can actually see that different links light up. And again, I want to point out that this particular linking approach allows you to not only predict links between enhancers and promoters, but also predict the specific cell type in which these links are active, which now allows us to do this type of um, uh, analysis. Puya Karatpur then said, can I now take these modules of enhancers that are active in coordinate ways and look for sequence motifs that are enriched or depleted in red or blue within these clusters, which allows us to now start pointing at the upstream regulators that actually might be uh, responsible for that. So we can actually represent that as, either as a matrix or as a, as a, a graph, where for every regulator, we can show the motif that was used to find the enrichment, as well as the cell types that are targeted by that regulator. So that allows us to now start predicting not only the linking between enhancers and their target genes, but also the linking between the upstream regulators and their target enhancers across the genome. So we can now start distinguishing regulatory motifs that happen in context or out of context. For example, HNF4 is enriched in liver and liver-associated tissues. When it occurs inside an enhancer that's active in liver, 
we're now going to call this a driver motif instance. And when it occurs in a brain enhancer, we're going to call it a non-driver instance. And what's really remarkable is that the in-context or the driver instances are in fact showing a much higher conservation both across mammals and across uh, in humans based on uh, this relative constraint that you can measure based on uh, human diversity data from the thousand genomes. So whether a motif occurs in context or out of context actually has a very strong effect on whether it's going to be selected or not, both in mammalian scale as well as in human scale suggesting indeed that we are able to uh, pick out true regulators for these motifs, that they're much more likely to be functional. But you'd like to also be able to disrupt these motifs and then see if there's an expression change downstream of that. So in collaboration with Tarja Mikkelsen at the Broad Institute, we basically used this uh, massively parallel reporter assay technology to uh, carry out individual single nucleotide mutations for seven different regulators for uh, five uh, activators and two repressors in two different cell types, HEP-G2 and K562. So just to summarize the technology briefly, we basically synthesize uh, an Agilent array of 200 nucleotide uh, intervals that uh, contain, that are centered on the regulator motif itself, where we use the wild type sequence, a scrambled sequence, we delete that sequence, or we make a single nucleotide uh, decrease you know, minimum change or increase of the binding affinity as well as two random changes. And what you can see here is just how well this recapitulates the predictions based on the pre position weight matrices for these motifs. You can see here that if I scramble the sequence, I lose this wild type expression. You see that this assay can actually tell the difference between HEPG2 and K562, even though this is not in its original context. We're only using the sequence of that element, and that suggests that there is enough information within these 145 nucleotides that we're using uh, to actually recapitulate the cell type specific activity. Again, challenging a little bit of that notion of these large monolithic enhancers, and that uh, single base pair changes that, changes that least disrupt or that maximally dis increase the affinity in fact, preserve the cell type specificity, uh, and then random changes either preserve it or disrupt it, depending on uh, whether they disrupt the motif or not. So this is you know, very good news for you know, us bioinformaticians. It basically says that when we're predicting these sequence-based targets, they actually have something to do with driver instances that can uh, affect uh, enhancer activity or not. So let's now use all of that information of uh, these modules of enhancers and genes, these networks linking these upstream regulators to their target enhancers and ultimately to their target genes to actually start interpreting uh, disease uh, association studies. So the first thing that we do, uh, this is work by Luke Ward, is to look at what tissues are even relevant uh, to the specific diseases that we're interested in. So uh, for many of these diseases, we actually don't know what tissue we should be studying across different uh, individuals when we want to go and carry out a genomic variation study. So this gives you a basic roadmap for what are the tissues that are at least are showing an enrichment in their regulatory elements for specific diseases. And a lot of these make a lot of sense. For example, you see height are enriched in many tissues. You see uh, rheumatoid arthritis, actually, this one doesn't, oh, no, actually you see corneal structure enriched in brain. Again, uh, the cornea is in fact a brain uh, tissue. You see immune traits that are associated with uh, immune uh, uh, cell types and um, so on and so forth. So you can now start browsing all of that data in a website that Luke has built. It's called uh, Haploreg for haplotype regulation. It allows you to now mine all of the ENCODE data sets and all of the roadmap data sets, as well as these driver predicted motifs uh, in, you know, across different cell types. And now for every genome associated variant, it actually looks at the entire haplotype block surrounding it, because any of these nucleotides could actually be the driver nucleotide. And it actually gives you hypotheses that you can actually go and test uh, experimentally. Uh, he also compared the performance that you get for enhancer regions uh, across the 127, uh, 24 tissues in this particular case versus DNA's regions, 
And what he found is that enhancers are showing a higher activity than DNAs, which is sort of expected because we only have DNAs in 39 of those tissues. But if you take the intersection of enhancers and DNAs, you actually see a larger number of genome-wide association studies that are showing an enrichment, even though it's now a limited <coughs> set of tissues, suggesting again that the higher resolution afforded by DNAs is increasing your performance. If you look at super enhancers, these large clusters of enhancer regions that Reed Young has defined, you see a much larger number of enrichments. But now if you actually look at the enhancer patterns, you see a dramatically higher enrichment. Why is that? Because if you look at this picture, there's a lot of blocks of many cell types that are active in similar ways that are showing an enrichment. And the reason is that these are actually part of pathways that are uh, allowing you to get much closer to the mechanistic base of the disease rather than everything that's active in any immune cell type. Instead, you can basically say, well, uh, what about T cells versus B cells versus whole blood versus uh, ubiquitous enhancers? So again, I think the way to think about these data sets is to no longer start thinking at a single tissue at a time, but instead to use the many tissues to discover, discover common patterns that cut across tissues and then now compare these patterns directly to the disease data sets. So again, you can do this prediction, but this only tells you about the tissue that's relevant. We want to go further. We want to now start dissecting these subsets of elements that are uh, important. So uh, what Gerald Kwon has done is use a Bayesian framework to improve these predictions. How? Well, by knowing what tissues are enriched, you can then prioritize the assignment between enhancers and SNPs and by knowing which transcription factors are enriched, once more you can prioritize those transcription factors that are targeting multiple of these genome-wide association kits. So what he's actually doing is that he developed this expectation maximization framework that starts with the genetic evidence, the genome-wide association study p-values. It starts with a regulatory network that links every transcription factor to its predicted target regions in each cell type individually based on the combination of these enhancer marks as well as DNA's hypersensitivity. And it also starts with the uh, network that connects every SNP to all of the enhancers that it could potentially be disrupting. How? Because some of them are direct disruptions when the SNP is sitting within the enhancer element, and some of them are indirect because that SNP is in perfect LD with another SNP that is in fact sitting in that enhancer. So we can actually represent that as a network to make the search much easier. So you can now start with this ambiguity of mapping between SNPs and who the real target enhancer is, this ambiguity of which are the relevant transcription factors, and simply iterate between the two and update the causal regulatory regions, and then using these predicted causal regions, update the trait relevant regulators and iterate. Because if you know one, you can predict the other much uh, more easily. So the output of that search is the set of trait relevant transcription factors uh, at the trans level, a set of causal SNPs at the cis level, as well as their target genes based on our uh, previous linking between enhancers and target genes. So here's one example. In this particular uh, case, there's an LDL cholesterol associated locus. It sits in the AFF1 gene. It spans the last few exons of that gene. And I'm zooming into this region right now, uh, showing that there are four SNPs three of which are sitting in enhancer regions, but all four of them are linked to all three because uh, of LD. So we don't know whether it's this SNP or that one that's uh, the driver. And this is the set of upstream regulators. And, when the, um, and, and the green uh, links are in fact showing you the predicted target genes for these different enhancers. So depending on whether you're predicting this enhancer or that enhancer as causal, the enrichments that you're going to be calculating at the gene ontology level are in fact going to be for different genes. So by running his algorithm, he can now predict that it's in fact those two genes that are more likely to be the target based on the <laughs> genome-wide occurrences of these regulators that are repeatedly associated with regions that are disrupted in uh, LDL cholesterol. So doing this across all traits, he can now predict for every cell type what, so first of all, what are the relevant cell types? And then for those enriched cell types, what are the regulators that are likely to be driving this? So again, we're making more and more precise predictions about who the upstream regulators are, who the downstream target genes are, who the causal SNPs are, and uh, we need to actually go and validate them. So what I'm going to tell you about now is an example 
we have actually gone in to mechanistically dissect uh, disease-associated locus as a model for um, how these particular predictions apply across the genome. So this is work by Melina Klausniter, who basically focused on uh, the, the FTO locus. And the, uh, the set of uh, inferences that we want is to start with a genome-wide associated region, just like in the previous picture, and start predicting, number one, wh what is the relevant tissue and cell type? Number two, what is the causal nucleotide variant? Number three, who are the downstream target genes of that variant? Number four, who are the upstream regulators that are binding that particular variant? And of course, number five and six, who are the cellular phenotypes and the organismal phenotypes <coughs> that are downstream of this? And this, I would say, are the six tenets that one should have for every non-coding variant. That's sort of what our community uh, should be striving towards. And until we have all six, it's very difficult to say that we have dissected any one of these me mechanistic loci. So again, let's apply that now to the FTO locus. Uh, here is the FTO locus. Many of you may know it as fat and obesity associated. It actually stands for FUSTO O uh, initially, just because it was a series of genes, M, N, O, P, and so on. Uh, there are 47,000 nucleotides within here. 89 variants that are in strong LD with each other. This is the reported variant uh, by the genome wide association studies. This is the variant that we believe is actually uh, the causal one. And uh, this is the strongest association with obesity across African, European, and Asian populations. Uh, and this spans the majority of intron 1 as well as a small part of intron 2 of FTO. And there are no coding variants in LD. So it could be either rare variants or a regulatory variant. So FTO made the news recently uh, based on uh, this particular paper uh, by the Nobrega group that basically noticed that there's a, uh, this obesity-associated variant within FTO forms a long-range functional connection within Rx3. So they basically looked at mouse, and they asked in embry embryonic uh, or adult brain, is IRX3, which is uh, sitting right there, forming co connections with FTO? And here's the primary data. You can basically see here the signal. There's uh, a lot of connections out there, one of which is, in fact, sitting in the FTO locus. So uh, this is not the first time that the FTO locus is implicated with IRX3. In fact, in 2010, there was a paper uh, in zebrafish that basically, again, predicted that there's a direct link between pancreatic IRX3 function and obesity uh, and type 2 diabetes. Uh, but again, these papers are agreeing on IRX3, but they're sort of the only ones. There's a, a lot of other papers that are suggesting that FTO is the target, that this other gene nearby is the target, that um, you know, EQTLs are pointing to two genes, allelic activity is pointing to different genes, the mouse knockout is pointing to some genes, uh, the synteny is implicating IRX3, uh, and uh, 4C confirmation uh, is suggesting that, in fact, it's the brain that is the relevant organ. So there's a lot of uncertainty in FTO, and I'm going to ask you to not tweet on this part, please, um, and, uh, because I'm going to spill the beans. Uh, <laughs> um, turns out that when we look at the chromatin landscape across the 127 uh, epigenomes, brain is here, and it's sort of showing some activity, which is nice, the 47,000 nucleotides are here, so I'm showing them in 10 kb blocks. And then you see that for mesenchymal stem cells and the descendant organs of uh, fat, as well as muscle and osteoblasts, are in fact showing this 12.6 kilobase long enhancer much longer than any of the other tissues. So brain doesn't even register here. Uh, suggesting that perhaps there, FTO has something to do with adipocytes rather than just brain. So what could be going on here? So what Melina did is that she actually started um, uh, doing enhancer assays using each of the 10 KB segments. So she used human SGBS, the human SGBS cell line, and then inserted either the risk or the non-risk haplotype for FTO using five 10 KB tiles. And then he show, she showed that the first tile, exactly where you see this massive enhancer, is in fact um, the uh, most likely to harbor this variant that's functional because it actually shows a very strong difference between the risk and the non-risk haplotype. And then she tested that one segment across five different cell types, 
with and without what we predicted to be the causal SNP. And then she sees a very strong effect in adipocytes and a you know, somewhat moderate effect, which is not significant, unfortunately, in neuronal uh, stem cells. So what she's, uh, what, I mean, so that was basically identifying the relevant cell type, which we believe is, in fact, the adipocytes. Number two, we wanted to figure out the candidate uh, driver SNPs. So we used the whole genome for this. We basically looked at all of the regulators that are enriched in these BMI-associated adipocyte loci versus adipocyte loci. In other words, this is not relative to the rest of the genome because we didn't want to just rediscover adipose regulators. What we wanted is relative to what you would expect for adipose, what is the increased enrichment for these BMI-associated loci. And we're finding a large network of regulators, including IRX3 itself, that are in fact targeting a large number of loci. And you can see here a painting of these regulators on top of this region, which is starting to suggest potential motifs where this particular variant could be happening. So uh, in addition to that, we actually use PMCA, which is a method that Melina actually de uh, developed, to basically look for conserved motif modules across species. And the highest score in this first segment was in fact uh, exactly at that particular locus, this RS1421085 uh, SNP. So here's a zoom out. What you see here, a zoom in, what you see here is three different regulators that are sitting on top of this particular SNP. It causes a C to T. Uh, actually, the, the C is the risk variant, the T is the regular variant, and that T is in fact predicted to disrupt uh, three different potential regulators. When we looked at uh, the expression of these regulators, we found that ARID, this middle motif right here, is in fact the most strongly expressed in whole adipose as well as adipocytes. Uh, for both lean and obese individuals, it's by far the most strongly expressed. And it's actually, it's actually part of a family. And among all the family members, ARID5B was, in fact, the most strongly expressed. So we you know, decided to pursue that one, and we got lucky. Okay? So expression was sort of how we got to the likely upstream regulator. And again here, I'm showing you, with and without that particular SNP, the expression of the activity of that particular enhancer. At the 10 kb level, you see a very strong difference. At the 1 kb level, you see a very strong difference. And at the 100 base pair level, you don't see any difference at all, suggesting that, in fact, those additional motifs are very important. You can't get the activity simply based on 100 nucleotides. So we believe we have the causal nucleotide for the FTO locus. Out of the 89 in LD and the 47,000 uh, in that particular locus, we believe we have the candidate uh, target. And now what about the target genes? So I've now taken this uh, big FTO region, uh, this 50 kb region, and I've zoomed out to basically look at the uh, 2.5 megabases surrounding the FTO locus. And uh, what we're doing now is that we're going to test every single one of these genes as to whether it is dependent on the particular genotype at the FTO locus. Okay? How are we going to do that? We're basically gathering 20 individuals who are homozygous for the non-risk allele and 20 individuals that are homozygous for the risk allele. And we simply go and measure whether that haplotype is in fact uh, predictive of the expression level of the neighboring genes. And from all of the neighboring genes, there are two that pop up. IRX3, which sits 500 nucleotides away, 500,000 nucleotides away, and IRX5, which sits 1.1 million nucleotides away. Again, suggesting that simply looking at the neighboring gene is not going to cut it. So uh, we're... Um, we basically are now showing that these are directly affected by the genetic variation in the FTO locus, not simply showing a physical interaction. So we believe we now know the target genes of RX3 and RX5 and the target uh, tissue. And previously, it was reported that whole tissue adipose is not actually showing an EQTL for uh, either RX3 or RX5, but in fact, that is completely consistent with our data because it's only in adipocyte precursor cells that we see this, not in whole adipose tissue. Again, emphasizing the importance of testing the correct cell type within the tissue. So um, we wanted to test now the prediction of the model. So our model is that the SNP is perturbing a DNA motif for the ARID5B regulator. ARID5B itself is a repressor. So when the regulator binds, 
it actually represses the enhancer, this 12 kb super enhancer, and it uh, therefore represses the downstream target genes RX3 and RX5. So what we wanted to know is actually what is the cis-trans analysis of both the risk allele and the non-risk allele in combination with an siRNA against the upstream regulator. So if you look at now the enhancer activity, you see that when you have the uh, regulator and the sequence motif intact, you see repression of that enhancer. When you perturb the, the uh, regulator, you see that the enhancer turns on, so the repressor is out, so the enhancer turns on. When you perturb the motif, the repressor can no longer bind, the enhancer is on, and when you perturb both, of course, it's on. What about the downstream target genes? So IRX3 and RX5 are sitting downstream here. We again did the cis-trans conditional analysis for both the motif and the uh, uh, regulator using our homozygous individuals for both CC and TT. And again, you see that the target genes are on whenever you disrupt either the re regulator or the motif or both, but not when both are intact, then you see repression of the downstream target genes. So again, we're, we're doing this trans conditional analysis to show causality here that in fact that particular uh, nucleotide variant is in fact downstream of the specific regulator and uh, upstream of the um, uh, two target genes. And then lastly, the correlation between IRX3 expression and IRX5 uh, expression is in fact uh, negative and significant when you have the motif, but absent when you don't have the motif. So this is all great. We've basically established, uh, we believe, the relevant tissue and cell type. We've established the causal nucleotide. We've established the regulator uh, that sits upstream, as well as the target genes. <laughs> but I haven't told you at all how this is related to obesity. All I've drawn is a nice little sort of circuit that tells me about the regulatory circuitry, not yet the cellular or the organismal circuitry. So what we need to do now is actually figure out what that variant actually does. What is the connection? with uh, obesity. So that's what Melina took on next. So she basically started using the IRX3 and RX5 target genes to basically look at their correlation in expression with different processes across the genome. And what did she find? She found that IRX3 and IRX5 are positively uh, co-regulated with, uh, sorry, positively co-regulated with lipid anabolism and negatively correlated with mitochondrial function. So they seem to be sitting in this switch between energy in uptake and energy dissipation. So if you uh, push this uh, particular network in one direction, you're going to get increased uh, adipocytes, in increased lipid storage. If you push it on the other direction, you're going to get increased mitochondrial activity and uh, reduced BMI. So I apologize here because we have this triple negative repression where you basically have this repressor of this enhancer which turns on these genes which repress energy dissipation and when you have a motif disruption it disrupts the repression thereby activating the enhancer and turning on energy storage and off energy dissipation. Uh, I've color coded everything so red is obese, uh, green is lean uh, and uh, every mutation is actually color-coded according to uh, whether it leads to obesity or not. But the idea is that the risk individuals who have the CC variant would be showing an energy shift towards lipid storage and away from uh, mitochondrial function and uh, energy dissipation. And indeed, when we take the same 24 and 24 CC homozygous and TT homozygous individuals, you see this dramatic difference in all of these uh, mitochondrial function genes, anabolic lipid uh, metabolism, adipocyte differentiation, and so on and so forth, you know, consistent with the RX3 and RX5. But we want to continue doing this cis-trans analysis in order to actually uh, show that this upstream regulator and the specific circuit that we're predicting is in fact causal for all of this. So we again did this siRNA against ARID5B to basically show that this oxygen consumption and relative glycosal release, which are associated with energy dissipation and lipid catabolism, are in fact dependent on both the cis and the trans activation to again get closer to causality. And we also knocked down and knocked out both IRX3 and RX5, showing again a reduction in fat stores, more green, 
And then we also did an overexpression RX3 and RX5, uh, again, in human cells in this particular case, to basically look at um, the uh, lipid function. And indeed, whenever you turn on RX3, you go towards storage and obesity. Whenever you turn them off, you go towards dissipation and lean. So that's the cellular phenotypes. What about the organismal phenotypes? So we actually built a dominant negative mouse that uh, is uh, expressing a dominant negative RX3 specifically in adipocytes. And now I'm comparing this to the uh, hypothalamus-specific RX3 dominant negative, and you see the reduction in fat mass ratio, which is only 10% in the case of the hypothalamus, but uh, you know 60% approximately in the case of adipocytes. So a dramatic phenotype, which is stronger than the knockout, uh, is in fact seen here. And you see that these mice, where I'm now turning off IRX3 and then moving towards dissipation of energy and lean, you see that these mice are in fact um, completely impervious to this high-fat diet. So when you put them on a high-fat diet, they just don't gain weight. It's sort of nice to be that mouse. Um, <laughs> And you see that, again, there's this dramatic reduction in uh, uh, fat. You see, if you zoom in to the specific fat stores, you see they're, they're dramatically reduced uh, between the adipose dominant negative and uh, the control. You see, again, at the histological level. And then what are, what are these mice doing? So they're eating uh, more of their body weight than their obese colleagues. They're, in fact, on an absolute level, still eating more. They're not really exercising more either during the day or the, during the night. They're simply spending more energy just by, you know, um, heat dissipation. So it's neither energy intake nor exercise. It's simply more energy expenditure. So how is that possible? Well, let's go back to this diagram here. They're actually turning on this UCP1 gene which depolarizes the mitochondrial membrane leading to proton loss and heat dissipation. I'd love to have some of that. You basically simply waste more energy, whether in your sleeping or eating or running around, and uh, all of that is downstream of that single nucleotide variant. So to summarize, we basically have this FTO locus, which has remained mysterious, and there are many pharmaceutical companies that are focusing on FTO year after year, and right now they're starting to focus on RX3 in the brain, but what we believe is happening is an adipose-specific, tissue-specific, brain-independent effect where the upstream regulator, RE5B, is acting in adipose to bind this RS1421085 nucleotide in this uh, GWAS-associated region, turning on the expression of RX3 and RX5 um, in the risk allele where that repressor can no longer bind and then that super enhancer turns on. And the downstream consequences at the cellular level is mitochondrial increased activity and lipid uh, storage. And then at the organismal level, it's heat dissipation and, of course, this dramatic phenotype on body weight. So you guys can start tweeting again. Um, all right. So uh, lastly, in the last few minutes of the talk, I'm going to tell you how we can, beyond these individual variants, which take many, many years to dissect, I want to sort of give a little bit more of a discouraging uh, note that we're nowhere near done. Uh, so beyond these genome-wide associated uh, loci that are actually significant, Abhishek Sarkar basically wanted to know how far down the rank list does this enrichment continue for specific trait-relevant loci. So he looked at type 1 diabetes and took all of the SNPs and then ranked them based on their association with uh, uh, T1D. And then he looked at the enrichment down the rank list for different annotations. So he looked at immune cells and non-immune cells. And you see this dramatic difference. All of them end back here at zero, and that's how you get your expectation. And what you're measuring is the deviation away from that expectation early in the rank list, very similar to gene set enrichment analysis. So now I'm going to zoom in to just this very tip of the iceberg here to basically show the difference between different cell types. And in all of this, I'm excluding the major histocompatibility locus, the HLA region. Um, and you see that across tens of thousands of SNPs, you basically see this enrichment in uh, non-coding loci. And you see the same thing in transcribed regions, but not in promoter regions, perhaps because they're much less cell type specific. 
So uh, in collaboration with Fielder Jaeger, uh, a student in my lab, Matt Eaton, basically asked, well, do we see similar uh, kind of story for methylation? So uh, we published a paper recently uh, in uh, Nature Neuroscience looking again at the top loci. But what Matt said is, what about the rest of the loci? So in this particular case, we have genotype, we have methylation, and we have the chromatin state annotations uh, in the context of the roadmap epigenomics project. And you know, this is just a gratuitous slide to basically say that there are actually 50,000 methyl QTLs the moment you start looking at 700 individuals. And again, we're now searching a whole megabase surrounding this region, even though most of them concentrate here, suggesting that there's a dramatic effect of genotype on methylation. But the point that I want to make is that if you rank now all of the methylation probes based on their association with Alzheimer's disease, you see this very dramatic enrichment for enhancer regions down the rank list. If you rank them based on age, you see an enrichment for polycom associated regions, not enhancers. And if you randomize the phenotype, you see, you know, there's no uh, comparison here. This is much, this enrichment for enhancers is much more significant than any randomization. And what's really remarkable here is that these regions that are associated with Alzheimer's in uh, their methylation profiles are also harboring genetic variants that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. So the genetics uh, seem to be pinpointing the same loci as the epigenetics. And even though the epigenetics do not have any pretense of causality, they are pointing at regions that themselves contain causal variants. Whether these causal variants are in fact influencing the methylation is something that we don't have the power to, to study directly across the whole genome. But at, at least at the uh, ensemble uh, way, you, you, you sort of see this very dramatic enrichment. So what we're finding is that uh, if you rank now, going back to type 1 diabetes, if you rank all of the SNPs in half your cohort based on how associated with, uh, they are with the, with the trait, and then you use the other half of the cohort to, ca to calculate heritability of those ranked SNPs, you again see that there's about 30,000 loci that are explaining all of the heritability that you get um, with the whole genome. So what this is suggesting is that there, there are, in fact, that both the genetics and the epigenomic annotations are, in fact, agreeing that this is uh, you know, a signal that persists well beyond the genome-wide significant loci across thousands of different regions. So Xinjiang Wang, in collaboration with Laurie Boyer and uh, David Mill uh, at MGH, uh, basically said, well, let's start testing some of those below significance regions. Let's, uh, let's basically ask, what is the uh, effect of the neighboring genes of these below significant loci that are sitting in epigenetic annotations on the particular trait that we're studying? In this particular case, uh, the QT interval of the heart repolarization. And he showed that, indeed, for three of the seven loci that he tested, the neighboring genes, in fact, showed a dramatic difference in um, uh, repolarization duration uh, when perturbed in vivo. So that suggests that, again, these below significance variants are, in fact, uh, very strongly associated. So in the last two minutes, I'm going to tell you about the convergence of somatic mutations uh, in cancer. So I've told you about these genome-wide significant variants, these rare variants of uh, you know, potentially or, or weak effect variants. And now I'm actually going to uh, shift to somatic mutations. So what Richard Koper, uh, in, uh, Richard Koper Salari in the, in the group did is he actually asked about mutations that are happening not at the gene itself. So he basically said, well, prostate cancer doesn't have a lot of protein coding mutations. Let's start looking at the non-coding mutations. So for every gene, he built its regulatory plexus, connecting it through high C interactions to all of the regulatory elements annotated based on the chromatin state in the whole genome. And he then asked, even though across different patients, each mutation may disrupt only one of these elements, do I see convergence and recurrence of the same network being repeatedly dysregulated across patients? And what he found is that the genes that show differential expression in prostate were, in fact, very strongly enriched for these distal cis and these distal trans mutations. And they, they were enriched in enhancer states of, that, uh, of prostate, as well as quiescent states in prostate, which were, in fact, enhancers in other cell types 
suggesting de-repression of these distal elements leading to activation of those genes. So then he built a computational framework to start sampling the regulatory plexus of every gene to control for the variation in regional mutation rate, in state-specific mutation rate, and in tumor-specific mutation rate. And controlling for all these three, he's basically able to count the number of mutations in each individual per chromatin state, and then compare that to what you would expect using these shuffles, and calculate an enrichment for each of those, which then gives you a set of genes whose regulatory plexus is enriched in specific chromatin states, harboring repeated mutations across these individuals. And he found exactly 16 genes that are genome-wide significant in these accumulation of mutations. They lie in a small number of pathways, immune evasion, insulin, androgen signaling, as well as mitochondrial function. And they harbor either many mutations or few mutations. And they, they are, again, extremely significant. So that suggests that not only do we find this convergence at the gene level, we find convergence at the pathway level uh, for these non-coding mutations. So I believe that this approach of actually studying somatic and very low frequency mutations will be immediately applicable to a lot of the rare variants uh, that we're now starting to get from uh, whole genome sequencing study. So how about convince you about the power of epigenomic data sets for interpreting disease uh, uh, studies? So uh, for characterizing the epigenomic landscape, for understanding the differences between cells and tissues, understanding these activity patterns in order to derive modules and networks to link transcription factors to their target enhancers and to their target genes, and then use that to identify disease-relevant tissues and uh, regulators based on enrichment of those SNPs, understanding these enhancer modules, as well as this Bayesian model for propagating this genetic information and how we can actually start mechanistically dissecting disease-associated loci, identify the relevant cell types, the causal variants, the regulators, the targets, as well as the cellular and organismal phenotypes. And lastly, that there's a lot of work to be done. There's a large number of variants that are showing enrichment below this genome-wide significance threshold, and they tend to converge in these common uh, pathways. I tried to highlight the folks doing the work uh, throughout the talk, but this is Valder Millerman, Jason Ernst, Luke Ward, Gerald Kwon, Anshul Kundaji, Matt Eaton, and Abhishek Sarkar. Um, and this is in the context of the Roadmap of Genomics Project. And this is everybody on my roof deck back in Boston. And the, the folks who contributed the most to my research are obviously my wife and son. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Manolis. Thank you. An impressive body of work by anyone's standards. Uh, do we have any questions? What about insulators? Do you think it could be possible to, to predict uh, the, target, the target genes to be repressed uh, by insulators? So uh, in this particular case, our linking does not re depend on whether it's an activator or repressor. So, is your question whether insulators are going to have a role in sort of... Uh, so we've done a lot of these experiments to basically try to, to understand, computational experiments to try to understand the role of insulators. And what we're finding is that based on our links, uh, whether, there's an, uh, whether there's an insulator or not makes a very strong difference as to whether a particular element is going to be linked to its target gene. So I think the presence of insulators, the understanding of the architecture of different loci is going to play a major role here. What we're providing is an activity-based linking uh, approach. EQTLs provide an additional approach. Physical interactions provide another approach. The understanding of the grammar, if you wish, of insulators, activators, repressors provides another approach. I think what we're missing and what you know, some of us are working on is integrated models that use all of this information to end up with the final probability of linking for every gene in every cell type. And I think insulators are going to be a key player in that. And in our, in our hands, they do have a, a strong signal. Stefan? Well, thank you, Manuel, for this yet again inspiring talk, which is why we keep inviting you back. It, it is <laughs> really uh, fascinating. Uh, and uh, I have a number of questions that I will uh, ask later, but I wanted to make one point, which I, I've asked you also historically, I think, several times, which is the imputation, which I asked for it, now you have delivered it, and now I ask you whether there's a problem with it. But first, it's, it's fantastic that you can impute uh, this really large amount of, of, of missing data there. And the question I have is that the imputation is 
is, is really so clean. It's almost too clean. And uh, my problem I have with it is that, of course, noise might be the biological function in there. So for me, epigenetic switches are the noisy bits in the genome. Now the imputation is so clean, uh, so the question is, is there a danger that you lost the biological information in this? So um, it's, it's, it's an awesome question, and we worry about it tremendously. So here's the way that I think about this. At the level of the whole genome, what imputation does is tell you whether a data set is good or bad. No, no questions asked. Basically, if, if genome-wide uh, a data set has low similarity to the predicted data, I'm, I'm, I'm betting everything I wear <laughs> and everything I own that the, the observed data has the problem. Now, if you go to individual loci and you start seeing that this data set has a global agreement, but in this particular case has a disagreement, I'm again going to bet everything but in the other direction that if the data set is good, when you see a difference between the imputed data and the observed data, that that difference is pointing to interesting biology. And here's the test that we did for that. We basically said, let's take all the places for high quality data sets, i.e. global agreement, that show local disagreement, and take all the regions of local disagreement, and now look for regulatory motifs. Boom, out come all the motifs for each of these cell types. So the local disagreement between imputed data and observed data tells you about biological function, which is above and beyond what you would have predicted. But if you're wondering whether that data should be noisy or not, let me show you this plot. In red is the imputed data. In blue is the observed data. You're saying, well, perhaps this noise that we see is indeed truly biological. Here is one uh, adult brain versus um, another adult brain. And here's how their data sets look. In other words, this is not uh, biological variability. This is really, truly noise. So when we do see a deviation from these, global, from these very precise patterns, it is data sets for which two near replicates don't even agree with each other. So I would, you know, I, I, I'd be very surprised if this, I mean, like some of them are actually showing the opposite pattern. And those are the same data sets that are showing low quality. So I, I, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Let me also uh, just make a very clear statement to this crowd uh, so that I'm not misquoted. The only way we can do imputation is by having a bunch of observed data sets. In other words, don't think that I'm telling you to stop doing experiments. Let's all keep doing a bunch of experiments. But let's not just simply take the inter experiments as they are. Let's process them, understand these correlation patterns, and you know, spit out a much higher quality data set, which will continue to improve as we continue to generate data. <laughs> <laughs> it's there. It's there. Duncan and George. Uh, staying on the subject.